Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSurge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian and Maria Digby, we bring you CRAMSurge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. So um, I'll talk about validity and reliability in, in, in surgical research. Um, I'm only going to touch upon the very brief principles of validity and reliability, the massive topics in, in, in and of themselves. And I've got a few um, relatively straightforward questions at the end. So um, if you're still with us, if you don't mind um, putting your answers in the chat box, Gio can maybe read out the answers and, and comment. Um, uh, I thought um, I'll try a few questions um, at the end of a short talk and see how that works. Okay, so we'll talk about what validity and reliability mean. Um, I'll explain some uh, types of validity, types and subtypes and a couple of types of reliability. Again, uh, I'm gonna keep this very brief. Uh, I'm not an expert. Uh, I do come across um, these aspects of validity and reliability in my own research and in my reading of literature. And I think it's useful to uh, refresh our memories as to what these actually mean uh, and hence this talk. And like I said, I've got a couple of examples and questions um, after my explanations, and then we'll summarize. So hopefully it won't be too long. So uh, we've all heard of these um, concepts um, in, various, uh, in various aspects of our um, research and practice. There are all sorts of terminologies that um, we hear and we sometimes, sometimes perplexed by, worried about, that we don't fully understand them. And, and uh, we're gonna be um, summarizing some of these, uh, uh, a few of these concepts. And we'll keep it as, I'll keep it as simple as I possibly can. So essentially, um, I would look at these two terms as measures of quality. So we'll talk about validity first and then uh, reliability. So validity simply refers to the accuracy of a measurement or a test or a scale. And it refers to the degree to which the test or the measurement that you do truly measures the concept or the construct it is supposed to measure. Now, if you think of an example, the one uh, that came to my mind straight away was um, the SF36. So you may have heard that SF36 is a measure of quality of life. And it looks at various domains of quality of life. And these include uh, physical domains, emotional domains and social domains. And essentially, um, if you wanna measure the quality of life of an individual or your patient, um, and you have this tool in hand, you want to look at this tool and say, this actually truly measures the quality of life in my patient, okay? So that's what um, validity refers to. The reliability on the other hand, refers to the consistency of the result of a test. In other words, it relates to the degree to which the test result or the measurement is free of error. So if you look at the SF36 quality of life measurement tool again, and um, if you want to say that this is a reliable tool, um, you want to um, make sure that the score you get on the SF36 in a single patient Let's say you, you, you ask the patient to do the score three or four times within a day, uh, you would expect the score to be the same if the test is reliable. Okay, so I hope that makes some sense. I've got another uh, example. We'll look at it slightly differently. Let's say um, you want to ass assess uh, the ability by which you can get to, uh, you can uh, throw darts and you aim at the center of the um, uh, at the middle black circle. And let's say you have five goals with dots. And let's say these are the results that you get. So you, you aimed five times and these are the results. 
of your five throws. And you can see that you're very close each time um, you, you throw the dart, you're quite close to the other four, but you're a bit away from the center of the circle. So essentially you've been what you would call consistent, but not very accurate because far, you're far away from the center. So uh, you would be considered to be reliable, but not very valid. Okay. Let's say your friend uh, has another um, uh, five goals and he or she, um, her results are there on the right side of the screen. And you can see that um, um, his or her results are a little bit less consistent in that they're slightly all over the place compared to yours, yeah? But they're a bit more accurate because they're more close to the um, central black circle. So his or her results would be less reliable, but more valid, okay? So I hope this gives, uh, this conveys um, some meaning to these terms, validity and reliability. Right, so lots of different types of validity. And, uh, and these concepts and these terms are often used in psychological research. And in psychological research, uh, you deal with lots of what we would call unobserved constructs, or you could say abstract constructs, right? And whereas in surgical research, a lot of the time we have uh, really defined observable um, outcomes or constructs, okay? But still a number of types of validity are very re relevant to surgical research. And so it's important for us to uh, um, have uh, some understanding of these concepts. The first type of validity is what we um, refer to as content validity. And this refers to whether the tester instrument measures what is important and whether it measures everything that is important with regards to the concept of the construct. Okay, so these are referred to as relevance and comprehensiveness. In other words, that particular tool should be relevant and comprehensive. Now, for example, if you want to measure um, the weight of 100 patients, you take a weighing scale and, and uh, you, as long as the weighing scale is accurate, um, you, you check the weight and uh, you have what you, um, what you want to um, have, what the data that you want to have. If, for example, you want to calculate the BMI of your 100 patients, then you need a, a weighing scale and you need a measuring tape yeah, to measure your height. If, for example, you want to assess nutritional status, then you and I know that weight and height alone are not good um, or sufficient measures of nutrition. And you'd want to measure lots of different things such as albumin, hemoglobin, hemoglobin um, maybe levels of different kinds of vitamins and so on and so forth, right? So you can see that whatever tool or measure you have in your hand, you've got to look at it and see whether it really measures what you actually want to measure. Right, so um, you've probably also heard of the term face validity and face validity is basically a type of content validity which um, you used to say that on the face of it, this tool uh, measures what you want to measure, okay? So a face validity gives you an overall assessment of the tool. For example, um, based on what we've discussed just now, we talked about nutritional status. We say on the face of it, BMI is not a valid assessment of nutrition, okay? So you can see how face validity is a subjective assessment. And uh, um, as with face validity, any type of content validity, the assessment is, is actually quite difficult. You need to be able to um, get the information about the construct and the context, or the context meaning the environment in which you're assessing, whatever you're assessing. You need to think about what is actually being measured, okay? And if you're not the expert, you need to get a expert panel to assess if your measurement is relevant and comprehensive, okay? And then you use a framework to assess the correspondence or the correlations between the measurement and the construct. So it becomes a bit abstract, it's a bit difficult to do uh, very well. And, and uh, like I say, this is a subjective process, assessment of content validity. The next type of validity, uh, which I think we as surgeons can relate to quite well, 
is what we refer to as a criterion validity. And this simply refers to the extent to which um, your instrument, uh, your measurement correlates with the gold standard. So the key thing here is that you have a gold standard. Now there's a type of uh, criterion validity called concurrent validity. And this is um, uh, the classical example uh, of this is the validity for diagnostic tests. For example, if you want to look at um, CRP as a diagnostic test for appendicitis in patients coming to the a &E with right left force of pain, then essentially you're looking at concurrent validity. Now, predictive validity is um, validity um, that applies to predictive or prognostic scores. So uh, here, the gold standard is not immediately available to you. The gold standard test or the outcome will become apparent over time. And therefore, um, you're looking at a, a test that's trying to predict what the gold standard will be over time. And a classic example would be a nomogram. So if you devise a nomogram based on, say, um, stage, grade, um, age of the patient, with breast cancer and you want to predict five year survival, then this would be a, a good example uh, for predictive validity. You want to see if the nomogram has good predictive validity in terms of it being able to give you a good idea of what the five year survival of your patient will be. And so these um, are uh, things that are a little bit easier to assess. So lots of different statistical methods of assessing how good your concurrent validity or your predictive validity um, is going to be. And these really depend on the data type, what type of uh, uh, data uh, you have with regards to the gold standard and with regards to what you're measuring. For example, uh, if it's a binary um, a variable, uh, you want to know if the CRP is high or low, and you want to predict whether a patient has appendicitis or not, then you look at the sensitivity and specificity of the CRP. Okay, If you have a CRP as a continuous variable, as a measurement variable, and uh, you want to predict the risk of um, uh, appendicitis, then you can use an ROC curve. We've talked about ROC curves before, receiver operating characteristic curves. Right. The third type of validity, so we've talked about content validity of which face validity is an important type. We then talked about criterion validity where you have a gold standard and, uh, and, and uh, you look for how valid your measurement tool is. So the third type of validity is uh, what is referred to as construct validity. Uh, and then this um, is useful in settings where you do not have a gold standard. So construct validity refers to how well the instrument measures the construct in the absence of a gold standard, okay? So um, this is less powerful than criterion validity. And also simply because there is no gold standard, it's a bit more difficult to conceptualize and assess. So I won't spend too much time on this trying to explain this because I myself do not have any personal experience of um, testing for construct validity in any of the research that I do. And, but essentially, there are three aspects to it. The first is structural validity, which looks at how well the uh, tool does uh, with regards to measuring all the different dimensions of your construct. The second is hypothesis testing. And here you look to see how well your tool does compared to other tools measuring similar or dissimilar concepts because you don't have a gold standard. So you just have to go and uh, compare your tool with other tools that are out there. And the third aspect is uh, what is referred to as um, cross-cultural validity, wherein you're looking to see how well a tool can be adapted to other populations or other cultures. So there might be a quality of life tool like the SF36 that works very well in the UK, and you want to go and apply this in a population in Asia where the language is different, and, and uh, there are many, many contextual and cultural differences. And then you want to see how well this particular tool um, measures quality in that different setting. And like I said, assessment of whether the tool really has construct validity is, is quite uh, complicated and um, uh, it takes, um, uh, it's quite extensive and takes a long time to do.
can I uh, make another example of that? Yeah, sure. If that's right. Uh, on on if you think about a test or any test that you you're taking as a doctor, that test is supposed to be able to identify how good of a doctor you are, or how good of a doctor you're going to be, or how good of a surgeon you're going to be. So okay. the con the construct validity of the MRCS, if you like, is supposed to be related to how well the MRCS is able to pick up good SHOs that are going to be good registrars. Yeah, the score of the MRCS, yeah. Supposedly, if you yeah. apply the concept of construct validity to a test. Yeah. And the same goes for the FRCS. So if I take the FRCS and I have a good grade, I'm supposedly going to be a good consultant. That doesn't necessarily mean it's true, but that's yeah. how yeah. construct validity works for a test, for example. Yeah, perfect. Sorry. Amazing. That's a really good example because again, there is no gold standard. So who, what is the gold standard for a good surgeon or a good trainee? And, and there can be all sorts of different um, attributes to what makes a good um, surgeon. Uh, and then you're hoping that your FRCS score or your MRCS exam score um, will relate to many different um, uh, aspects of uh, being a good surgeon. Yeah. So Absolutely. That's, uh, uh, that's a good one. Good example. Okay, so when we talk about validity, um, like I said before, we talk about content validity, criterion validity, and construct validity. But we also talk about validity when it comes to research papers. So we, we critique research papers and we say, oh, this paper is not very valid, um, or this paper is not very, the results of this paper is not very generalizable. So this is where you come across these uh, the two terms, which we've not talked about before. And these are um, internal validity and external validity. So these are concepts that relate to the quality of an entire study, not a measurement, not a tool. Okay, so internal validity refers to whether the design and conduct of a study has resulted in an accurate answer to the question that's being asked. In other words, simply was the study free of bias? So if you're doing a randomized controlled trial, if you haven't done the randomization properly, or if you think you've blinded your patients but the patients really knew what treatment they're getting, or the patients that were randomized to treatment A actually did not get treatment A, and there were many such patients, in other words, you had lots of protocol deviations, these issues or problems may not and may stop you from getting to the truth. And therefore you might say the study is not internally valid. In other words, the quality wasn't great because of problems with the design and conduct of the study. Okay, so this is internal validity. External validity refers to whether the findings of the study can be generalized to other settings or contexts. In other words, um, let's say you've done a randomized controlled trial of robotic hernia repair and compare that with uh, laparoscopic hernia repair, incisional hernia repair. And let's say you've shown that the results of the robot are superior to laparoscopic hernia repair. But the problem is um, in your study, in your center, that might be the case, but would this be a, a, the case in another center, say in another district general hospital, in another population, in the hands of other surgeons who may have different experience and expertise compared to your own centers? Okay, so that's referred to as external validity. Now, there's another term called ecological validity. I wouldn't worry too much about this. This is a, a type of external validity, and this is not a term that's used very much in surgical research. And it was previously proposed as a concept to explore if the results in the lab would be replicable in real life. In other words, it's a kind of external validity, like I said before, but I wouldn't worry too much about it. Okay, so we've talked a lot about uh, validity. What about reliability? Like I mentioned before, reliability um, is related to um, errors in measurement. Okay, so if there's a lot of error, that means um, the tool um, or the measurement is less reliable and vice versa. As you probably uh, can imagine, there are two types of reliability. One is inter-rate reliability and the other is intra-rate reliability. And uh, just to think of an example, 
uh, let's say you want to measure tumor size after radiotherapy or chemotherapy on uh, CT or PET scans, and you have a, a radiologist do all the measurements uh, of uh, the tumor on the scans of all of your patients after a particular treatment. Now, obviously, there, uh, there can be different ways in which the actual measurement can be made, and there could be differences um, between um, radiologists, and there could also be differences within the same radiologist. If you ask the same radiologist to take the measurements uh, another day, they might give you slightly different values. Okay, so that's what is referred to as inter-rater and intra-rater reliability. Remember, reliability um, refers to consistency. So each time the same radiologist or somebody, another radiologist is doing the measurement of the same tumor in the same patient, you want the results to be consistent. So assessing reliability is relatively straightforward. Just like with criterion validity, uh, there are lots of different methods by which you can assess whether somebody is being consistent or not. And again, these methods are really based on the type of data. Now, uh, I'll just mention the statistical methods. Uh, you may have come across some of these before. So if you have a continuous variable, um, so if so somebody's um, allocating a score to a tumor, tumor based on its CT appearances, and that score ranges from, say, 0 to 25. Uh, and if you've got two sets of radiologists looking at the same set of scans, then you want to see if they are being consistent. Then you use a particular statistical uh, parameter called intra-class correlation coefficient uh, or Pearson's row correlation coefficient. So, uh, so that's for continuous variables. If you've got ordinal variables, where you're classifying a particular value as uh, you know, low, moderate, high, and then the method to use is uh, weighted kappa. And if you have categorical variables, uh, then it's Cohen's kappa. But if you're not, if you're not um, heard of these concepts before, um, I wouldn't worry too much about it. If at some stage you have to uh, do some research that involves these concepts, you can always look them up. Right. And um, keep in mind that validity and reliability relate to quantitative research. So if you're doing qualitative research, then uh, again, you want to make sure that your qualitative research tool, your qualitative research study is also uh, of good quality, right? But applying these concepts directly uh, is quite uh, difficult because, uh, like I said, these concepts relate to quantitative data. There are some alternative concepts that have been proposed, uh, like you can see on this slide, there's something called truth value, consistency, confirmability, and applicability. Again, these are measures of quality that are a little bit similar to validity and reliability, but I'm not going to go into the details. I'm no expert, but there's a nice little very short paper that I've referenced to that you can see at the bottom of the slide. And if you're interested, you can have a look. Okay. Now I've got a few questions. So here's the first one. So you set an analog alarm clock to go off at 6 a.m. every day. You find that the alarm goes off at 6 a.m. as shown on the alarm clock in a consistent manner. After a week or so, you, you realize that you've actually been five minutes faster every day. Okay. So the question is, um, which of the following is correct? The clock is reliable and valid, neither reliable nor valid. Reliable but not valid, valid but not reliable. What do you think? So I think, I think. it is um, quite reliable at waking you up when it clocks the six, but it's not very valid at actually telling you that it is six because he thinks it's six, but it's not. Yeah, yeah. So it is consistent. So we say yep. it's reliable. Yep. It's not very accurate. So we say it's not valid. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. That's great. Um, so that's just to reinforce the concept. That's all. Right. The next one is slightly more difficult. So you've developed a new scoring system for patients with bowel cancer, uh, and you're testing its predictive value in determining overall survival. Which aspect of the score's quality are you testing? Are you testing content validity, construct validity, inter-rater reliability, phase validity, or predictive validity? 
Yeah. So, so the, the thing I'd say first is, um, you know, I'm thinking is this validity or reliability, mm. and um, uh, it, it is not reliability because uh, yeah. you're looking to see how accurate this uh, particular scoring system is going to be. You're not looking at consistency at all, so you can rule out integrated reliability. The next thing you're looking to see is, uh, you know, uh, is there a gold standard? If there is a gold standard, you're looking at uh, it should be criterion validity, yeah, like yes. for a predictive yeah. test. If there's no gold standard, you can think of construct validity. If you're thinking, uh, oh, I just want to see if this uh, scoring system um, measures everything you're supposed to measure, whether it's relevant and comprehensive, then you do, then you look at con content validity, but that's not the uh, question here. The question is whether you're able to predict something that you really know will happen in a few years that you, and you, therefore you do have a gold standard. Mm. So the answer is criterion validity, okay? Right, so the next one, this is a study from Asia. They've looked at a stoma quality of life scale for patients in the local language. Uh, to see if this can be used to determine quality of life and well-being in patients with a stoma. Uh, there is an existing English language tool. So they adopted this, translated this, assessed, got it assessed by an expert panel and also a group of their local patients. And then the scores were compared with other quality of life scales and pain scores, abdominal pain scores, to, to evaluate convergence and divergence. Convergence meaning, you know, how well it goes with other uh, um, how well it correlates with other scores and divergence is uh, how poorly it correlates with other scores. So what aspects of quality of the scale are being studied? And the options are there on the screen. It's a bit tricky, but uh, I mean, the first uh, question is, are we looking at reliability or validity? Again, we're not looking at consistency here. We're just looking to see if the quality of life scale mm. um, really is assessing quality of life. So, um, well, I think if, if this compared with a with other scales that are already tested in the gold standard, that should be criterion again. Um, so, for quality of life, you got to think about um, mm. this construct as really never having a gold standard. Concurrent, then. Yeah. Concurrent, so, yes. Um, so, um, so the first thing to say is you want to make sure that this quality of life score assess all aspects of quality of life, that it, it includes everything that is relevant and it is comprehensive. Okay, so that is face validity. Yeah. The next thing is you don't have a gold standard. And therefore, you need to see if the this tool that you have really goes well with other similar tools. So that will be construct validity. Okay, so um, essentially, face validity and construct validity is what you're trying to um, test for for this new scale. Yeah. So uh, anyway, you, you've got to think about it sometimes and you've got to go back and look at the definitions, but uh, I'm sure you're not going to be put in a spot in, in an exam situation and be asked these questions. But if you're coming across a paper uh, or if you're doing your own research and want to look at validity, then uh, you've got to think about these concepts. Okay. So the thing to remember, um, the way I remember or try to remember is that validity refers to accuracy and reliability refers to consistency. Okay, and then you can build upon, uh, build upon the, the, this um, basic fundamental concept. So under the term validity, you got to think about content validity, criterion validity and construct validity. When it comes to uh, research papers or, or studies, then you think about internal validity and external validity. Um, under the term reliability, um, uh, the only two things that really is useful for us are inter-rater and intra-rater reliability. And just keep in mind that these relate to quantitative or measurement tools. And occasionally, 
especially when you're thinking of external or internal validity, they relate to the research itself. Okay, so there's a couple of uh, good references, or, um, or I thought they were good, that you can look up. And particularly, there's a textbook called Measurement in Medicine that devotes um, entire chapters to validity and reliability and how to assess them. And especially if you're designing your own research, um, it, it might be useful to um, have a look at these references and make sure that uh, you are making sure that your research is um, valid and reliable. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep ramming your life with our surgical podcast.